Long ago, two races ruled over Earth. Humans and monsters. Sorry about the steam thing down there. One day, war broke out between the two races. After a long battle, the humans were victorious. They sealed the monsters underground with a magic spell. Many years later, Mount Ebbet, 2016. What is this, Mega Man? Legends say that those who climb the mountain never return. That, 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 that's it. That, that's all that I have in terms of voiceover. Also, that character looks like Dora. Anyway, I digress. Um, hope you enjoy the review. I promise it's not going to be this level of shit. Um, but you know, I, I'm good. I'm 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 a good reviewer. Stick with me. Hear me out. Stick with me. I'm a good reviewer. I'm like, uh, uh, who, who's your favorite reviewer? Angry Video Game Nerd, Scott the Waz. Uh, I'm, I'm good, trust me. I, 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 have a, I have a level of quality, and then you know, I, 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 I deliver on the quality. I mean, it's That was the intro to the indie hit RPG phenomenon, Undertale. Minus the weird voiceover thing, I mean... Well, I mean, like, who would buy a game that has a voiceover like that? Like, let's be real here. Let me just say this right off the bat. This game is freaking incredible. You don't need me to tell you that. I mean, chances are you're probably tired of hearing all the praise this game gets. If that's the case, grow up, because if somebody loves a video game, they're going to talk about it. Simple as that. Well, might as well just play the damn game rather than rant and rave about how good it is. You know, this is why we can't have nice things. It's because you don't like when I do things like say when a game is good. It's too much negativity on this damn platform. Let's name the fallen human and begin. You start off as this. Okay, let me just say that this is probably the ugliest protagonist I've seen in a retro style game. I mean, look at someone like Ness. A preteen with a sideways baseball cap, a striped shirt, and plenty of pep. Then there's Lucas, who makes up for his lack of attitude with his humble design. And then you have Undertale's protagonist, who looks like a rejected Simpsons character. It seems they were going for a Madotsky look with the face, but it makes this character come across as incredibly lifeless and boring. And guess what? That's the only bad thing I have to say about this game. I mean, at least this character doesn't really say anything. Unlike some asshole from another Earthbound-inspired RPG that I'm not even going to mention right now. Anyway, you meet your first friend, Flowey, or is he your friend? Nah, he's just an asshole hellbent on murdering you. Cool. Anyway, you're then introduced to the real first ally of the game, Toriel. Toriel is a goat furry milf who guides you through the ruins. Jokes aside, this is where the character design starts to really shine. Toriel gives off a friendly sense of security and kindness. And I wouldn't mind actually having Toriel as a parent, and I'm sure many people feel the same way. The game has a sense of humor. It starts off subtle, but throughout the game there's plenty of fun NPCs to talk to, amusing flavor text, and of course the dialogue. Er, aren't those three the same thing? Ah, whatever. Let's talk about the battle system. It's actually unlike anything I've ever seen in an RPG. It looks like Earthbound, but functions a lot differently. First off, fighting. Don't do it. J j just don't. Instead, you select the ACT button, which allows you to interact with the enemy, whether that be talking to a training dubby, complimenting a frog, or flirting with a gelatinous slime. Basically, you can spare your enemies and get through the entire game without taking a sim single life. For example, this is Napstablook, a ghost who doesn't seem to have any self-confidence. By encouraging him, you help him feel better about himself and he leaves you alone. Damn. How convenient, huh? Not a single enemy down here has the true intention to kill you. Could you imagine if this protagonist was put up against someone like Gygus or Lavos? Now that's something I want to see, even though it's probably not going to happen considering, you know, they're from different games. Another vital mechanic of the game is dodging attacks. Each enemy turn, you'll have to move your heart-shaped soul around to dodge in a pseudo-bullet hell kind of way. I like this, because you don't have to grind or level up, but rather rely on your own skill. If you haven't played this game yet, and want to after watching me talk about it for a bit, by all means, stop watching this video and 
go play it. This might sound cliche, but it's an experience you will never forget. Also, the rest of the video is going to have spoilers, and this is one game you do not want spoilers for. Well, in some cases. You'll, you'll, I'll get to that later. You're still here, huh? Well, let's continue. Toriel turns out to be, in fact, very overprotective of you, downright blocking you from leaving the ruins. That means that you gotta fight her. She's obviously reluctant to actually attack, and all you can really do is repeatedly try to spare her until she eventually comes to her senses. After a heartfelt goodbye, you leave the ruins. Oh look, it's this asshole again. Well, that was a good, albeit a little short game. Um, overall, Undertale is really really well made um i again it was really short but you know wait, wait a minute oh there's there, there's more all, all right kind of creepy gets off yumaniki vibes kind of the fuck was that Okay, now I'm scared. What the fuck is going on? Human. Don't you know how to greet a new pal? Turn around and shake my hand. <laughs> Played me like a damn fiddle. Well, it's Sans. This is the character you're all waiting for, right? Yeah, even if you've never played Undertale, you probably recognize the pun-loving skeleton. Sans is basically the fan-favorite character of the cast. He's not my personal favorite, you'll see my personal favorite soon, but I can't see why people love him. I mean, his first appearance alone is enough to make you roll on the floor laughing. I mean, look at this. So, bro? You know what's up, brother? It's been eight days and you still haven't recalibrated your puzzles! You just hang around outside your station! What are you even doing? Staring at this lamp. It's really cool. Do you want to look? No! I don't have time for that! What if a human comes through here? I want to be ready! I will be the one! I must be the one! I will capture a human! Then I, the Great Papyrus, We'll get all the things I utterly deserve! Respect, recognition... I will finally be able to join the Royal Guard! People will ask to be my friend? I will bathe in a shower of kisses every morning! Hmm... Maybe this lamp will help you. Sans, you are not helping, you lazy bones! All you do is sit and boondoggle! You get lazier and lazier every day! Hey, take it easy. I've gotten a ton of work done today. A skeleton! Sans? Come on, you're smiling. I am and I hate it! Ah, why does someone as great as me have to do so much just to get some recognition? Wow, sounds like you're really working yourself down to the bone! Ah! I will attend to my puzzles! As for your work, put a little more backbone into it! <laughs> That's another fun thing about this game. 
The characters act so realistically that you can basically hear their voices in your head as you play. Like, for example, Sans sounds like a more laid-back Patrick Star. Papyrus sounds like a more upbeat Skeletor. Y you get the idea. You're now in Snowden, a large snowy forest where the Skeleton Brothers sort of get in your way, but in reality they just provide enough comic relief to keep you more than interested in the game. Dogs are a recurring motif in this area. There are a few dog mini-bosses. Now let's talk about this game's creator, Toby Fox. He's also a dog. It's, it's true, I swear. You then arrive in the town portion of Snowden. This is where the game starts to feel more like Earthbound in terms of sheer amount of charm it has. In most RPGs, at best the NPCs will give you useful information, but in Earthbound and Undertale you actually want to talk to everyone to see what they have to say. Now, I won't say that Undertale is better than Earthbound, but it definitely amplifies a lot that Earthbound had to offer. Papyrus tries one last time to stop you, this time by actually battling you and taking you head on. You avoid a few bone attacks, and then he changes the color of your soul to blue. Now your soul controls more like a platformer. These battles are always fun, and you'll never get bored of fighting an enemy or a boss, because they always spice things up. Once you spare him, he becomes your friend. Yeah, it turns out Papyrus is a huge softie if that wasn't apparent already. And he doesn't really care about catching you, but rather being popular. Depending on your actions, you either go on a date with him or simply hang out. Either way, it has the same outcome. Now the game is a dating sim or something? There are some parts of this game that I really can't describe in detail, you just have to see for yourself. After showing Papyrus a good time, you find Sans, who also wants to hang out. I like these friendship segments a lot. Not only do they provide more fun dialogue between characters, but they also elaborate on plot points and most importantly, strengthen bonds between you and other characters. On the date with Sans, I, I guess it's a date, you notice that this character is more than he seems to be, even if he's his usual goofy self. He talks about his brother and a strange flower that's been talking to his brother. Oh. Well, shit. Anyway, now we can progress to the next area, Waterfall. This is where the game starts to get heavy on lore. Throughout the past, there's texts on the walls that explain the rich history of the monsters. I really like Waterfall. Not only is it beautiful aesthetic-wise, but it's where the game starts to take itself a little seriously. Not too seriously, though. While walking, solving puzzles, talking to people, and fighting muscular horse mermen, you start to hear people talk about Undyne, the captain of the Royal Guard. Simply put, Undyne wants you dead, and isn't a pushover like Papyrus was. Another character introduced is the Monster Kid. Yeah, he doesn't have a name. Monster Kid is basically a huge Undyne fanboy, and he thinks you are too. Even though you're, you know, trying to avoid her. A few chase scenes later, you find yourself in... a garbage dump. Hmm. I guess we'll keep going, and... Guts man! I knew it was you! After another unique and fun boss fight, you encounter- Oh shit, it snaps the book! There's a lot of things to do in this game that aren't necessarily required to get the best ending, like hang out at Napstablook's house where you can listen to his mixtapes and lay on the floor and feel like garbage. Whoa. 
Whoa, okay. The game doesn't necessarily have any side quests, but rather fun distractions that provide more lore and, of course, comic relief. Again, similar to Earthbound, it really makes you want to explore every nook and cranny of the game, trying to get every possible dialogue box in case you miss out on a joke or a bit of story. The prime example of randomness in this game is Temi Village. Basically, the Temis are this game's equivalent of the Mr. Saturns from Earthbound. The Temis, however, have no plot significance whatsoever and are purely joke characters, which is perfectly fine, as these things crack me up. I, I, I own a plush of one. You finally face off against Undyne, who takes off her helmet and immediately acts like a total badass. The best part is, she doesn't even come across as a tryhard, which takes some serious talent in character design. Her gimmick is turning you green, not letting you move, but rather block spears she throws at you. When she turns you red again, that's your cue to escape, once again refusing the fight. It's really fun seeing all the different ways you can not fight someone. If they're a pushover, befriend them. If they're hellbent on defeating you, simply run away. You soon find yourself in Hotland. You're still being chased though, so don't get distracted. Undyne collapses from the heat, you give her water, and she walks off. Before you actually continue on through Hotland though, you can actually return to Undyne's house to basically tie loose ends with her. This is where Undyne begins to be a lovable character just like the rest of the cast. At first, she wants to defeat you, until Papyrus challenges her to actually become your friend. Now, it's time for her to start acting like a tryhard. We're not just gonna be friends, we're gonna be besties. At first, it seems like she's doing it just for Papyrus, but as time goes on, she acts more and more like she's interested in being your friend. She's still an intense and over-the-top tomboy, but now she's an intense, over-the-top tomboy with a heart. After a cup of tea, she makes, she makes you take the cooking lesson that Papyrus missed. Long story short, you end up accidentally burning your house down. She doesn't care though, because now she has a new friend. Okay, now we can go to Hotland. In earlier parts of the game, a few characters mentioned a character named Alphys. Well, now you finally get to meet her. And wouldn't you know it, she doesn't want to fight or stop you in any way, shape, or form, even though she was told to. She just happened to start appreciating the way you get things done. I love Alphys. The best word I can use to describe her is, well, I can't believe I'm using this word, but adorkable. You get it? It's, it's adorable, but mixed with dork. And normally I can't stand stereotypes of nerds in the media. They're usually designed to be lame nobodies who happen to have intelligence, but Alphys has charm. Just like literally every other character in the game. You should expect this by now. So Alphys is an ally right off the bat. But there's a catch. She created a robot that was originally designed to be a celebrity called Metaton. The problem is, before she realized she wants to be your friend, she programmed him to destroy all humans on sight. Now you're about to meet my favorite character in the game.
Metaton starts a quiz show to the death, while Alphys helps you out by giving you answers. This reveals a few key points about these two characters. Metaton, being a celebrity, has a huge ego and is not afraid to show it. Alphys turns out to be a huge weeaboo, and then Metaton reveals that she also has a huge crush on Undyne, so, you know. Okay, now the game has won me over even more with its LGBTQ plus love interest. I'm a sucker for that kind of thing, alright? The game show ends, and you leave the lab to continue through Hotland. Oh yeah, by the way, the game's entire soundtrack is incredible. I, I can't even believe it took me this long to mention the soundtrack. Anyway, Hotland's theme is definitely one of my favorites. Here, let's take a listen. Metaton tries a few more times to get in your way, like having a cooking show where the most important ingredient is your soul. But who would have guessed that there's a vegan soul substitute, huh? I wonder if the underground has an equivalent to PETA. I I'm sorry, that, that was a terrible joke. There's another boss that you fight along the way. This is Muffet, and she's notable not only because she changes your soul to purple, but because she was actually designed by a fan who backed the project on Kickstarter. There are two other fan-created enemies, one of which is a normal out-of-the-way enemy called Glide, and the other originally being a fetish persona who is toned down and renamed to So Sorry. Swiftly moving on from that, let's- yeah, yeah, I, 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 I don't want to talk about that. Let's, let's keep going. You approach Metaton's resort, where you find Sans waiting for you, where he takes you out for a meal again. This time, he talks about a door near the outskirts of Snowden, where he hears a voice that laughs at his jokes. Wonder who that could be. And then he begins to get mysterious again. Jesus, Sans, what did I do to offend you? Or what could I have done to offend you? Hmm. I mean, for the record, he was joking, but still, very unnerving. Anyway, you meet some more fun characters, like Braddy and Caddy, two Valley Girl shopkeepers, who are surprisingly fun characters, despite having the type of personality that I normally stay away from in real life. And then there's Burger Pants, a minimum wage fast food employee. I love this guy, not only did he steer me away from working at a McDonald's in real life, but he's just overall a unintentionally funny guy, I mean character-wise. He says things like, I'm 19 years old and I've already wasted my entire life. I mean, I'm 18, but amen, brother. Amen. Again, referring to Earthbound, it's like the burger shop employees who are basically always obligated to smile at you. Only this time, the employee is less of an NPC and more of a character. Hopefully that makes sense. Anyway, you're off to the core, and it seems like your adventure is entering the final stretch. It shows, too, as you fight powered-up versions of enemies you previously saw in the ruins, as well as completely new enemies. Anyway, we make it to the end to face off against Metaton one last time. Apparently there's a switch on his back that I guess turns him off, so let's just do that and... Oh, yes. 
Hả? Oh no, he's hot. This is Metaton EX. If I wasn't already loving this character before, now I just wish there was the option to date him like you could with other characters like Papyrus. Yeah, Metaton's my robot husband. I, I, I love him. Metaton EX also has the most fun boss fight in my opinion. Your soul turns yellow, which allows it to shoot projectiles at obstacles, bullets, etc. After a heated battle, he realizes that his viewers are at an all-time high and he stops fighting you, mainly because he runs out of battery. Now it's time to face the King of the Monsters. No, not Godzilla. Over the course of the entire game, your friends have told you about the King, Asgore. Some say he's dangerous, others say he's a nice guy, but the mention of him still gives off an uneasy feeling, at least for me. There's a lot more to these plot points than what I'm telling you, so if you haven't played the game yet, I'd recommend it to get as much story as possible. Trust me, it's worth it. You finally meet him. It's time to leave the underground. It's time to go home. Oh dear. Well, I don't know what I was expecting. I mean, the game has to end somehow, right? You have to fight Asgore, and I mean it this time. Hopefully you had never touched the fight button up until this point, but now you're gonna need it, as the Mercy button has been smashed to bits. This is the hardest battle up to this point as well. It's not excruciatingly difficult, you know, this isn't Toho after all, but it will provide a challenge to dodge all of his attacks. Persevere, and you finally beat him. Uh oh, I had the chance to spare him. I mean, might as well. It's not like I'm gonna break my streak now or anything. Oh. He, he really is a nice person. I kind of feel bad for kicking his ass now. I, I don't really want to leave. I've, I've made so many great friends and... You know, it, it's... it's I, I don't mind living down here. Wait a second. No. No! You bastard! I forgot about this fuckwad and let my guard down and now Asgore's fucking dead! Fuck you piece of shit! I I I'm gonna kill him. I don't care about getting a good ending anymore. I want to see this fucking monster burn in hell. You are scum. I... Words cannot describe how much I fucking loathe you. You fucking... Demon. What happened? Did the game crash? Hmm. Maybe I can try again. Maybe this time I'll save Asgore. Who knows? What? My save file! Fuck! What am I gonna play now? My save got deleted! 
Might as well forget about the game, I guess, and play, I don't know, Hylix or something. God, I can't believe this game had to end like this. What did I do wrong? I mean, well, I don't know. No time to think about that now. I guess this isn't over yet, huh? is that? <laughs> well, we're fighting Cloudy. And guess what? He's hard. We're really hard. supposed to do? How am I supposed to beat him? He only takes one hit point of damage at a time, his attacks are unavoidable, and... Wait, wait a minute. What the heck is going on here? Call for help. That's it! Like in Earthbound, where Paula prays to all the friends they made to help them defeat Gygus. Okay, I can't lose now, let's fucking end this. Basically, you get help from all the souls from each human that fell into the underground before you. They help you by healing you and lowering Flowey's defense. That music sounds really familiar. Where have I heard that? His defense dropped to zero! Alright, Flowey, this ends now. <laughs> Get fucked. Should have known. He's using save states. Cheating bastard. Everyone knows that playing a game on original hardware is the way to go, not this emulator bullshit. Wait a minute, the, the human souls, what, what are they doing? I just said that, dumbass. I did it! I beat him! I beat Undertale. Now to just kill him and wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This won't bring Asgore back. It won't solve anything. Flowey, 
you're a dick, but I'm, I'm gonna spare you. He basically begs you to kill him, but I kept sparing him until he ran off. The game is over. You get a phone call from Sans and the others, they tell you that they're doing alright, but it sucks not, ha not having Asgore around. It's a happy, but very depressing ending at the same time. Well, we're finally done. In conclusion, Undertale, well, it's a great game. Tons of wonderful characters, astonishingly beautiful, yet simple design, and of course, this killer soundtrack. Though I feel like there's a lot of unresolved things. Alphys, for example. Yeah, she's like the only one without a proper character arc. It's weird too, she's such an important character, and she hasn't changed one bit. If anything, she's probably changed for the worse towards the end. She becomes less confident about herself. Was this game unfinished or something? Oh, it's, it's flowy. What do you want? There's a better ending? I can save this world? I don't need to start over to do it? Kick ass! Guess the game's not over! Might as well keep going. Flowey, you can blow me. I'm not gonna fight Asgore. I'm going to Snowden to see Undyne. Undyne gives you a letter, that I assume is a love letter, to deliver to Alphys. Alphys thinks it's from you, so she goes on a date with you. She then realizes it's from Undyne, but she tells you she's basically keeping a lot of lies secret. Undyne shows up, and Alphys slowly but surely confesses. And then Papyrus enters the scene. Honestly, I love it when these characters just come out of nowhere. It's like whenever you see Kramer enter the room in Seinfeld. You never expect it, but it's always welcome. And you always love it. Okay, so things worked out in the end. Alphys and Undyne are together. Wonder what Alphys meant about her compulsive lies, though. Go to the lab, alright, I mean... An elevator? Wait, wait, wait. Where, where does it go? What is this? Why did the game's tone take a 180? Why am I fighting mini Gyguses? This is the true lab. It's where all of Alphys' darkest secrets reside, and I don't just mean her hentai collection. This is where you find out why Alphys is so paranoid about herself. Here's the rundown. Asgore requested Alphys to do experiments involving souls to help break the underground's barrier. She uses what's called determination. Rewind a bit. The word determination is used at just about every, every save point you encounter. It always says that you're filled with determination. It turns out that it's not just a metaphysical concept, it's an attribute that human souls possess but monster souls don't. Alphys conducted experiments where she 
extracted determination from human souls, and injected monsters with them, causing them to melt and fuse together, forming what are known as the Amalgamates. This part of the game is fucking awesome! Seriously, the tone it sets here is so creepy, and it's really shocking to see it after playing the rest of the game. It's like you take the unnerving sense of danger from off, and combine it with the bleak atmosphere of Chrono Trigger's future segment. This proves that Toby Fox could have made an RPG horror game, but chose not to. Well, he kind of did with Earthbound Halloween hack, but you know, we'll get to that later. Alright, time to fight another one. Oh. Oh, this is different. It's a snowdrake, but it doesn't give off the creepy atmosphere that the others did. It just kind of makes me sad. What happened to you? You can't even attack normally. Oh man, the desire not to kill is probably the strongest here. Well, you tell it a few bad jokes to cheer it up. I guess you're reminding it of someone it once knew. Well, it's over now. I guess we'll keep going. Damn, that hit me hard. You get cornered, and then Alfie steps in to stop the conflict. It turns out that the families of the monsters that got turned into amalgamates are concerned, and the Alfie's decided to lie due to all the pressure. But now, she decides to return them to their families. This is probably the deepest character arc of the entire game. She finally admits that she's been living a life of lies and decides to set the record straight for everyone. Okay, now what? I guess we're gonna have to face Asgore again? Let's, let's hope everything goes well this time, I guess. Alright, Asgore. Let's get this over with. Holy shit, Toriel? That's right, she's back, bitches. That's right, Toriel makes her big return, throwing shade on Asgore in the process. And then comes in Undyne, who tries to stop the fight that she thinks you and Asgore are gonna have. And then Alphys comes in to do the same. Then Papyrus. Then Sans. And Sans and Toriel know each other, apparently, which is, you know, great. And then my robot husband encourages Undyne and Alphys to kiss. And, and then, oh, man, all my friends, they're, they're here. They're all here together. Wait a minute, am I forgetting someone? What the fuck? He lied to me! Get a better ending! He's just gonna take all the souls again and turn into that Albert fucking abomination and- UGH! Wait a minute. My friends. They're... Are they helping me? I mean, yeah, that's what friends do, but... Damn. Now more people are here. Monster Kid, Muffet, everyone.
Yeah, maybe that was a mistake after all. Wait, wait, wait a minute, you're not Flowey. Who, who, who are you? Did you just refer to my name? I've always been referred to as human. Why is this happening now? What the fuck? Hasriel Dreamer? Wait a minute. It's the end. Oh man, this is intense. Asriel probably has the strongest attacks in the game, ranging from dual wielding swords, shooting you with lasers, and, of course, PK Starstorm. Your two act commands are Hope and Dream. Hope increases your defense, and Dream allows you to cheat in Minecraft speedruns. No, 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 wait. It fills your inventory with, with healing items. Never mind. It's tough, but it's basically a scripted battle, as whenever you lose all your health, your soul refuses to break and you come back. Azrael is eventually fed up with everything and enters his final form. A flower, a giant plant creature, a goat, and now an angel of death. Jesus, how many forms does this guy have? You can't act or do anything. All you can do is struggle and try to dodge his attacks. But something happens as you struggle. You reach out and save your friends. The act button is replaced with a save button. You can select your friends to basically save them from their dark intentions. For example, Undyne's soul wants to kill you, Alphys lacks confidence, you get the idea. After you save all of them, there's only one left. Azrael. You're not getting out of this one, buddy. Mm-mm. Is it, is it over? Azrael returns to his kid form and uses the last remaining bits of his power to destroy the barrier. Yep, it's over. Your name is revealed to be Frisk, not the one that you chose at the start of the game. Let me explain. Hope you got all that, because if you didn't, you need to play the game. Seriously, what, have you seriously not played the game yet? If you have, you're fine, but... You wake up surrounded by your friends. They don't remember what happened, but the barrier is gone. You're able to backtrack and talk to all the NPCs you've met throughout the game, but I was too eager to finish the game once and for all. Once outside, they all stare at the sunrise. One by one, they set off to introduce themselves to the humans. The last one to say goodbye is Toriel. You have a choice to stay with her, but I'll be real with you. I have places to go. And with that, Undertale is over. Is it a good game? Of course it fucking is, what did you expect me to say? Undertale has so much that it does well. The music, the characters, the atmosphere, everything. The only bad thing I can say now is, it's over. I can't just play it again. Seriously, if you look past the credits, Flowey actually comes back for a bit to say that I have the option to to reset the world, but he discourages it, as the characters are truly happy in the timeline that they're in. And if you're familiar with the game, you are probably noticed that I left a few details out. That is for you to either figure out on your own, or you probably already know them by now. Stuff like how Metaton isn't 100% who he says he is. 
Maybe you'd want to see Braddy and Caddy for that information. Also, questions get raised. What happened? What, what resides in Sans's bedroom? Who designed the core? And most importantly of all, what happens next? Perhaps the most interesting part I purposely left out is the infamous genocide route. Basically, it's where you choose to kill literally everything in your path. It has a few completely original bosses, but in reality, it's not worth beating the game like this just to get what is probably the most depressing and unnerving ending I've alternate ending I've ever seen in a video game. You know. Like I said, very fucking great game. Absolutely astonishing. Um, only problem, like I said, makes me want more. Um, kind of makes me wish there was a, like, something along the lines of a sequel or something. Alright, here's the part of the video that's not scripted, as you can tell, as you can obviously tell I'm not reading off of a script. I'd like to thank you so much for watching my first, I guess, review. Um, next episode, as it implied, is actually, despite my implications, it might not be Deltarune Chapter 1. I might, like, branch off and do something different. Um, but I will do Deltarune Chapter 1. That, 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 that to-be-continued screen wasn't a lie, so... Uh, but yes, thank you so much for watching, um, I really appreciate all the support that my very small fan base, uh, like, very small as of right now, my small fan base gives me, um, I, I like, this is a complete, like, w turn away from what I used to do, which was live streaming, um, anyway, yeah, I, I won't ramble for too long, I'll let you get on with your day, but thank you for watching, I'll see you guys next time, take care.